Emerging a strong voice in modern cult cinema, S. Craig Zoller has proven himself masterful of genre filmmaking. His latest release, Dragged Across Concrete, is no exception. In the following video essay, topics such as Zoller's writing and dialogue, blocking and choreography, use of music, framing and characters, as well as other worthy aspects of his filmmaking will be discussed. The primary aim of this video essay is to relay to the viewer the qualities that make a Zoller feature such an enjoyable genre entry, as well as giving an insight into the director's style and how he constructs his narratives. Zoller is an impressive genre filmmaker who continues to improve upon his craft with each release, which this video essay aims to showcase how this is achieved. Finally, this video essay will serve both as a general viewing recommendation as well as a key analysis, although with this in mind, the film is rather gruesome at times, so caution is advised. Dragged Across Concrete features Mel Gibson as Brett Ridgman and Vince Vaughn as Anthony Lorissetti as two police officers who find themselves suspended after a video of them extracting police brutality goes viral. Ridgman, who wants to provide more for his family and move to a better neighbourhood, plans a scheme with his partner to rob criminals after they commit a bank heist. With this, the first topic of this feature will be discussed, which is characters and dialogue. Zoller is recognised for his strong characterization and sharp witty dialogue. Dragged Across Concrete is no exception. Whilst many entries in this genre would emphasise the moral divide between police and criminals, the supposed line within this narrative is constantly blurred, perhaps even completely irrelevant. Where this is especially evident is within the actions and presentation of the central characters, particularly Brett Ridgman, with their inciting incident causing them to be suspended, and is a perfect showcase of these characters' behaviours, particularly Ridgman. He is rough and physical with his suspects and police work, applying extreme brutality to any that may be deemed unlawful. He approaches criminology with little compromise or compassion, something which his captain criticizes upon his suspension. I watched that video a couple of times. You threw a lot more cast iron than you needed to. And when we worked together, you weren't that rough. And? It's not healthy for you to scuff concrete as long as you have. You get results, but you're losing perspective and compassion. A couple more years out there and you're going to be a human steamroller, covered with spikes and fueled by bile. There's a lot of imbeciles out there. Although perhaps unsurprisingly, both he and his partner share a rather antiquated and regressive view of masculinity and how it should be demonstrated and performed. Ridgman in particular being a relic out of time, unable to keep up with the evolving and ever-changing social climate, as well as approaches to dealing with criminality in a way that does not involve violence or the utmost retaliation. These partners both long for the time when police were viewed as a symbol of power and utmost public fervour, as well as reminiscing over traditional gender roles and the supposed older status of masculinity. It's a guy or a girl singing his song. Can't tell. Not that there's much of a difference these days. I think that line was obliterated the day men started saying, we're pregnant, and their wives were. Bridgman and his partner long for a past era, showcasing a bullish and destructive form of masculinity in a modern world that has seemingly left both them and their worldview behind. With their only source of income being cut short, these two partners look to a quick payout, stealing from a group of criminals after a bank heist. This is the course of action that enables both Ridgman and Anthony to cross paths in one of our other protagonists, Henry Johns. Henry and his friend Biscuit have come upon the opportunity to aid career criminals in stealing gold bars from a bank, an action that is clearly immoral, but is the precise reason and attitude expressed behind Henry's motivation to commit that crime that differentiates him from Ridgman and his partner. Johns doesn't feel as if he's owed anything or that he's unjustly persecuted, rather he undertakes this job purely to provide for his family lacking the ego and inflated sense of social standing that Ridgman appears to exhibit. Our central characters all share the same end goal, to provide for their families. With this similarity in mind, it is important to examine our characters' needs and wants in order to identify the primary differences that separate them, both in terms of their standing and moral outlook. 
Uh, he sets this, this world and he drops you right into it and you just want to know what's going on. It's so fascinating. And what he's, what he's done and what Craig's done with the character in writing it is he's created this hero that pops up out of nowhere and ultimately the movie becomes his, like it or not. Do I see any volunteers in the audience tonight? To better inform a story and the audience alike, it is important to identify what a character wants. A want can be defined as a desire that a character possesses that forces them into action. In order to fulfill them, or in the case of our characters in Dragged Across Concrete, they want to earn money through illegal means. A want could be identified as an external force, a plot device or sequence of events that puts the story in motion. A need could be identified as a necessity, something that the character requires in order to grow or fulfill their want. Our characters' needs in Dragged could be identified as needing to provide for their families. Upon successfully doing so, it could be said that our characters will be fulfilled internally. A character's want typically sets the character's plot into motion, whilst the need typically drives the theme and emotional core of the film. Although our characters both share the same core want and reasoning behind their actions, how their respective needs are interpreted and showcased by the character actions inform the audience of who they truly are as a character. One key example of which this is shown is the difference between Brett and Andy in contrast to Henry. Unfortunately for Henry, he needs to provide for his family quickly and through the only means he knows how, by partaking in criminal activity. Brett and Andy both decide to foray into the criminal underworld to earn money, although this action is not completely necessary or even supported by the very family they are to provide for. Brett and Andy undertake this job as a matter of pride. They believe that they are owed for being suspended, that they truly deserve this money for their perceived service and should not have to take any other menial employment to provide. There's been opportunities before, more than a few. Take a bribe, pocket a bundle, pill for cash. I was a cop on active duty today. I'm a poor civilian who's nearly 60. I can accept that, but I'm not gonna ask my wife and daughter to. If you put all our collars together, every imbecile we ever nabbed, it'd probably fill two entire wings of the state prison, maybe three. We have the skills and the right to acquire proper compensation. In many ways, this perceived right is our downfall, and as such, they are unable to fulfill their needs until it is too late. Andy's offer of marriage is rejected shortly before he passes away. Brett almost manages to complete his task and fulfill his need, although his pride again gets in his way. Throughout the film, line and African nature documentaries are played at various points and could be emblematic of our two main characters. Brett and Henry could both be seen as lions, hunters trying to survive, protect and provide for their pride. Unfortunately, Brett is blinded by his want and sense of self-respect. He pulls a gun on Henry after they make a deal. This ultimately ends in Brett's demise, although not before Henry promises them that he will leave them their share of the stolen money. In many ways, this elevates Henry's character above Brett. Not only did he fulfill his own need, he also provided support for Brett's family establishing him as the top predator of the supposed criminal safari. When I was out mailing that package, I started thinking about that game we was playing right before everything changed for us. The one in the jungle. You still got it? Shotgun safari? Yeah. You ready? Let's hunt some lions. One key area that Zolder's directing excelled in is how he decides to shoot scenes as well as their blocking and composing. Reapplying various techniques that were previously employed during the film and the fight scenes in his previous Brawl in Cellblock 99, Zoller prefers to often use a wide lens while shooting. Whilst most people might use a wide lens for establishing shots or to showcase landscape and environments to the audience, 
Zoller often uses wide shots throughout a variety of scenes, including both dialogue and action scenes. One commonplace convention of filmmaking while shooting dialogue scenes would be to use tight angles as well as shot reverse shot techniques between the characters. Zoller does use this technique himself, however, throughout this feature he showcases and uses more of the environment surrounding their characters or employs wide shots to show them within a particular environment. It's a very different style than my first two movies. It's a lot of locked off stuff. It's a lot of space and breathing, the camera. If it's moving, it's to just maintain a, a frame with the performers. The camera is never handheld. It's always very controlled. It's always very placed. It never moves unless a character moves. And those are the rules of the world. And when those accumulate throughout the experience of watching a film, those are some of the ways that the audience is very in tune and becomes very invested in a very specific kind of story and experience. What this can help do is establish the environment that the characters are inhabiting instead of purely focusing on the dialogue and reactions of characters. One particular scene that employs this tactic as well as more conventional shooting techniques is when Brett and Andy are suspended by their captain. The scene cuts back and forth between wide and closer angles. However, with the use of wide windows behind the captain and to his right, it gives the impression of the power and freedom that he exhibits over his now suspended officers. When Zoller cuts back to either Brett or Andy, the only notable background feature is that of a wall. It gives the impression that our main characters are now boxed in, defenseless with no options. A feature of Zoller's filmmaking that aids to enhance the characters in addition to their flight. An area of filmmaking that Zoller truly excels in is the construction and blocking of action scenes. These scenes may not seem as immediate or stylized as the ones featured in Sablock 99. It does however show an evolution of the style as well as being more complex. With an assured and confident directing style, Zoller finally lets our main characters face off in a tension filled climax. Whilst most other directors may shoot this more conventionally or with a swifter pace, perhaps even a full shootout with multiple casualties. Zoller approaches this scene differently. Drastically slowing the pacing of this narrative beat, it enables the audience to become fully immersed in the scene, the characters, and perhaps even more importantly, the blocking and positioning of the scene and characters. The geography of the scene is well established and covered. The audience is informed of each character's position in addition to where they are relative to each other. Much like the rest of the narrative, many locations used in this climatic scene are often underlit in rapid gloom alluding to thematic qualities found in the narrative in addition to a flying focus on our characters. Although there may be some distance between Brett, Andy and the criminals, the previous scene at the bank which resulted in the deaths of employees adds an additional layer of suspense that any of our characters may come to a grisly end. This previous bank scene in mind, coupled with the director's decision to elongate the climax with steady pacing, enables the audience to bathe in the tension and atmosphere. Like his previous action scenes in Brawl, the camera is steady and typically unmoving, enabling the audience to take in every detail and so nothing is missed. One such detail would be the violence and the way in which Zoller often portrays it. The violence displayed is quick, nasty and impactful, often with visceral but realistic sound effects. Although the violence shown in Brawl was extreme, there was a certain fantastical grindhouse genre feel to it that is not shared in Dragged Across Concrete. Whilst the camera might linger on the violence in Brawl, it is shown in a more effective way in this feature, usually cutting soon after the death occurs. This method of cutting away gives the effect of finality, a permanent end to these characters' lives, illustrated by cutting away from them and no longer permission their presence on screen. There is no clear and correct way to shoot action and its consequences, however, these slower paced artistic choice that Zoller employs enables the audience to fully establish a connection and understanding of the scene and action that is taking place. There is a sense of control and confidence behind the directing of his features, a form of authorship. This sentiment is especially evident with the use of soundtrack. Much like his previous work in Brawl, Zoller worked closely with the OJs, Butch Tavares and Walter Williams in composing the score. A soundscape indicative of 70s grindhouse and cop films is present throughout the narrative. One track in particular titled Shotgun Safari being a direct thematic reference to Henry Johns as well as the video game he plays with his brother. This hunt some lions. The use of an original soundtrack, particularly one composed in this style and tone, 
enables the audience to become better immersed in the narrative and world inhabited by the characters. Craig and I have argued, debated, discussed uh, use of music in film for a long time. He loves uh, and wants the, I should say, he wants the actors to um, express themselves on screen without being supported by music to tell the story in place of the acting and, and the, the, the raw emotion that's there. Typically, the soundtrack is used in a diegetic fashion. A character might be listening to a particular song on the radio. The fact that no non-diegetic music is used throughout the narrative has the effect of bringing the audience closer and more securely into the film's narrative. There is no breakage or barrier from the audience's access by using swelling, non-diegetic music to try and enhance a particular emotion or thematic quality. Rather, the audience is experiencing this narrative world as much and as closely as they can, even the shared soundscape in which they are both exposed to. Not to say that using non-diegetic music is wrong. For this gritty narrative, however, it adds great value to the world building and experience of the story. In conclusion, Dragged Across Concrete could be Zoller's most self-assured project yet. It encompasses all his earlier work's flair as well as showing an evolution of the style. The steady narrative and graphic violence may not be for all, however, fans of his distinctive style and gritty, almost underground filmmaking will find plenty to enjoy in this feature. It is arguably his most technically impressive feature to date. Currently, Zoller appears to be focusing more on his writing and novels, however, Movie projects are still forthcoming with one of his novels, Mean Business on North Ganson Street, reportedly being adapted by Ridley Scott. With an innate understanding of grindhouse genre filmmaking and a unique writing style, his upcoming releases must be met with excitement, even purely for the authorship on display.